am actually beginning, this past Tuesday began my 50th year in higher ed. I know I still look good, but nonetheless. <laughs> I began my career as a uh, faculty member in the psychology department at San Antonio College, which at the time was one of two community colleges in San Antonio. Now they have four. And uh, that just seemed like forever ago. And I was just so enthused about everything and just being there. So I'm going to take you down a, a memory lane trip. So we'll talk a little bit about how things have changed and yet how they've stayed the same. When I was a, uh, a student, <laughs> faculty members were next to God. I mean, we just, we were afraid of them, we revered them, whatever they said, we did. Whenever they said show up, we did. There was never a question about it. They, they stood behind a podium and they just espoused all of these truths. Uh, we believed every word they said and we just hung on every word. Uh, <clears throat> they were content area specialists, or what we now call sages on the stage. They weren't very technologically savvy, however. They were still doing overhead projectors and uh, transparency. Some of you may have been around long enough to remember that. Those of you who are just beginning your careers, go visit the Smithsonian. You can see them there. <laughs> Uh, they actually ask students their opinions, and having come, you know, from a K-12 institution, even though it was a Catholic school, uh, they didn't ever ask you anything. They told you everything, you followed the dogma, and, and now suddenly they want to know what you think. And that was when I first learned to not look at the professor when he asked a question so that he wouldn't call on me. That's where that comes from. Uh, but they actually care, or it seemed to care about students' opinions about things. Uh, they had lunch with us that, you know, you could find them in the cafeteria. We even, after night class, would go to the bar together. Uh, I mean, it was just phenomenal. You could, you could find them on campus during office hours, which was amazing. Uh, and most importantly, or at least most importantly to me as I moved into my career, was that they had very high expectations of students. We were all college ready at that particular point. And so they figured that, you know, we had the skills, we were going to do it. Students, as I said, we were smart, we were challenged. Uh, we came from all over the world, uh, not just, you know, from your local communities. <clears throat> they, uh, a lot of very smart people, so they used words I had never heard of. And I had to grow my vocabulary uh, very quickly. Uh, there were ideas that I had never thought of. I grew up in San Antonio, and so, you know, when you live in one place, you have that ideology, and now suddenly you're exposed to people from everywhere, lots of different places. It does expand your mind. I had never in, uh, engaged in a study group before. Uh, I had always, I'm an only child, so I had always had to learn on my own. In addition to that, <clears throat> I am a child of the 60s. So, in uh, some of you can, I heard that, mm, yeah. <laughs> For those of you who aren't, you missed a good time. That's all I can tell you. But it was, uh, it was a challenging time, too, because 1964 is when I went to high school. And that was when uh, integration, they had finally gotten the word that Brown versus Board had passed 10 years earlier and that we had to integrate schools. And in my freshman class, uh, there were five blacks. Yeah, we were still black then. My, uh, my grandmother was colored, my mother was Negro, I'm black, and my son's African American, so it's hard to keep up. <clears throat> but uh, we, were still, <laughs> we were still black then, and there were five blacks in my freshman class, two in my sophomore class, and I was the only one in my junior and senior classes. And so, you know, there, there was not a lot of socialization going on. Fortunately, my mother was a teacher, so I had the support I needed at home. Uh, I never got counseled uh, to go to college by a high school counselor. Most of my classmates did not go to college. As a matter of fact, there were 95 of us, and I think only three of us got advanced degrees, uh, from what I can tell. Uh, and I, I will always remember that uh, I took the PSAT, and they had this little circle 
there that said if you were a Negro student and wanted your scores considered by the National Scholarship Service and Fund for Negro Students to fill in the circle. So Sister Anselm looked at me, I shook my head, I filled in the circle, we kept going. She never read the directions. And that's how I got into Trinity. They offered me a scholarship because of those scores. So, you know, you, I was finding my way there. I had to be very self-directed because I was getting no <laughs> cooperation from anybody who was around. Uh, when I got to college, <clears throat> there were two different uh, groups of students. There were the town students who congregated in the student center all the time because they didn't have a dorm room. And then there were those dorm students who always escaped back to their to their rooms, and unless you befriended somebody who lived on campus, there were two very different cultures at that particular time, and we had very different behaviors, as it were. But <clears throat> the, the biggest point was we had all enrolled in a curriculum for college preparedness, and so we were all prepared to go to college. <clears throat> we weren't all prepared at the same level, but we were still all prepared and had a better understanding. More of us were uh, more than first generation students. I'm a third generation college going student, which is very unusual in the African American community. My son is a fourth generation college going student. Uh, and so there, there is a level or was a level of preparation there. Uh, in the fall of 68, when I went to high school, the academic advisors were very new. I had never heard of them. Uh, I could select, I'm sorry, when I was going to college, fall of 68, um, I got to pick my own classes. Oh my goodness, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm one of the few people that went in as a psychology major and came out as a psychology major. Uh, never changed a major, you know, I, I'm going to stick with this one. Uh, there were so many different things to do. I had gone to a, a high school that were limited uh, options for uh, support services and for student activities, and now suddenly I'm at this institution where I can make all kinds of changes. It was a, amazing not to get lost in the social life, um, you know, and, and they always teased uh, college students then about trying to fit classes into your social uh, schedule. And I had to choose a major. I chose a psychology major and sociology minor because my mother was a sociology major and a psychology minor. Uh, but we both liked people, so I figured that would be a good thing to do. But these were all new concepts, uh, you know, to me going to college. Nobody had talked to me about these before, but they were things that I had to navigate. <clears throat> Once I got to be an administrator in a college, I would actually work registration because students were then still lining up to register, okay? Uh, remember, this is a 50-year career. There were no, uh, they were sleep on campus so they could be first in line to get classes kind of thing, but they wouldn't talk to each other. And so I'd always go and encourage them to get to know each other. You know, they may find a date for the weekend, who knows? Uh, <laughs> And they always thought I was nuts, but it worked. But those were new concepts going into college. And so when I got to colleges, I found that classes were usually small, but there were a couple of large ones, none as large as this uh, theater, but uh, there were some pretty large ones. But I could go either day or night, which meant you know I could adjust my own time to get stuff done, uh, to work another job if that's what I wanted to do. There was an expectation, though, that you would uh, participate in class. You're not going to let the rest of life <laughs> get in the way, that you would be a part of what's going on. I had never read or written more stuff in my life than when I became a freshman in college, and it was almost overwhelming. The good news was, having been an only child, I loved to read, because that was kind of the, my entertainment growing up since uh, there, were, there were two girls and five guys on my street. And so when I wasn't talking to Elaine, I either had to play football with the fellas or I entertained myself with a book. Um, and so more often than not, I ended up reading. So reading was not the issue. Writing uh, was very, very different. Um, usually the, the college focus was more on general education. There was a big push to make sure that you knew how to read and understand what you were reading, that you could write so that other people could understand what it was you were trying to say, that you could analyze situations. Um, I have a, a son who um, <laughs> hated school. No, that's not true. He loved going to school. He just didn't want to do anything when he was there. <laughs> and as a lifelong educator, that was a challenge, trust me. And he came home one day and wanted to know, why do I have to take Algebra two? I'm never going to use those formulas. And I said, you're probably right, you won't. But what you will use are the skills that you learn to, to solve for unknowns. 
And he went, why didn't they tell me that? You know, then I would have paid better attention. So, you know, sometimes we, we don't explain things to students as to why they're doing it. They, we just tell them they have to do it. But uh, the, uh, the reading, the writing, the counting, the thinking uh, were very much uh, the, the majority of the curriculum at that particular point because we were all liberal arts majors. There weren't as many occupational technical programs at that particular time, especially not in our senior institutions. Now remember, this is late 60s when I'm going to school or, or uh, 72, uh, 74 when I'm starting my career. Community colleges began largely in the 60s. We were open in a school a day uh, uh, in the 60s. And so this began to change. And the focus on job training uh, you know, started um, invading the curriculum, as it were, even in traditional liberal arts institutions. But for the most part, we were there to learn how to uh, contribute to the world, to make a better place for all of us, to understand how systems work not just to get a job, which is a very different focus than today. <laughs> Administrators were largely recruited from the K-12 system for community colleges uh, because this was a brand new thing and historically community colleges were more like grades 13 and 14 uh, out of high school and so those were teachers who were experienced with that population so we recruited a lot of them into the community colleges. They had very long tenures in their positions uh, both in the K-12 system and in the higher ed system. Uh, they, again, we were busy opening a college a day. Uh, local communities were the key to the survival of community colleges. The land on which most community colleges is developed, uh, uh, donated and contributed by local communities and then the, the state would take over the funding of the actual building and, and faculty and curricula. So there was a, a strong connection there between the community and the institution, not just because I'm located there, but because they actually made contributions to it. And we were busy, uh, very busy trying to hire faculty and staff because this was a new thing called community colleges. People hadn't heard of it. They weren't quite sure whether it was a real college or, or how it fit. Unfortunately, some people still have a problem with that. Uh, I spent 28 years in community colleges. I have no problems explaining community colleges and how important they have been since day one and continue to be. But there are still people who are hanging out there. It's okay. Trustees were elected uh, or appointed to serve uh, different institutions, at, usually at community colleges. They were elected by the community, although they could have been appointed by the uh, local governments. Uh, they weren't always knowledgeable about higher education. Um, unfortunately, that is still true today. Some of them still aren't very knowledgeable about higher ed. They can run a business but they're not necessarily um, adept at understanding the role of faculty, for example, and shared governance, bless you. Uh, there are often uh, popular votes or donations that were the driving force for their selection. Uh, that, it, that tends to be truer for senior institutions. You know, you get appointed to a board because of how much money you donated to whoever is appointing you to the board. Um, but that's also true in, in community colleges. I have found in my work that there are different challenges between uh, trustees, uh, boards where trustees are appointed and boards where trustees are elected. Uh, you're serving a different master in their mind and so you gotta figure out uh, who's on first. Sometimes during that time they were perceived as to be rubber stamps for whatever the administration wanted at that particular time. That is not as true uh, nowadays, much to the chagrin of some presidents, but, but um, it, um, it, it, I'll show you how it's changed. And then primarily, at that point, that we were asking them to raise money and friends so that we could get buildings built and campuses put up, which was why in the 60s this was, and 70s, this was so important because, like I said, we were opening a college a day, and so we needed somebody who had access to those deep pockets or had deep pockets themselves to get it done. Accreditation was focusing on getting students into institutions. We wanted to make sure that there was access uh, for all students, uh, no matter what their academic potential or, or skills were, that there was a place for them. 
Uh, we specified curricular areas that you had to teach. I remember that in our own standards, they said, you know, you have to have six hours of, of history and six hours of English and 12 hours of this and, you know, I mean, we, we were very prescriptive in the Southern region about what courses students needed to take in that general education core. Um, we also said that if you were a faculty member, you had uh, teaching in a community college or a senior institution that you had to have a master's degree and 18 graduate hours in whatever you were teaching. And there were no exceptions to that. Um, we changed that in our region in 2002, which was I think 21 years ago. I still have institutions that haven't gotten that message. That there are, and, and this was largely because of community colleges in our region, because there was this new field called information technology, for which there was no master's degree, and there were no 18 graduate hours. You could take computer science, but that was not the same thing as information technology. And then the performing arts faculty said, well, you know, there's the same thing here. You know, we, we have difficulty in dance, for example, you can get a master's of fine arts, but there's no master's in dance kind of thing. So we changed our standards to say, you have to then make a case for what makes a faculty member qualified. And I still have institutions that struggle with that one. Um, two examples I use for, for our folks is, if you have a banker who has a bachelor's degree in finance, but who has successfully run a bank, don't you think he or she could teach intro to banking? I mean, just, duh. <laughs> or, or Nikki Giovanni, who d did not have a doctorate, but she had no problem, you know, teaching English at Virginia Tech. I mean, really? Uh, so there's some common sense things that accreditors have finally gotten to understand. Uh, but we were very rigid in our region for that. Um, very prescriptive standards. Today, <clears throat> faculty are more facilitators of learning than they are st sages on the stage. We are actually looking for ways to get students more involved in their own learning. Uh, because they're bored just sitting there listening to you preach. No offense, having been a faculty member who preached a lot, I understand. Uh, but it's just a very different clientele and they want to know how to apply what it is that you're doing. I worked at Northern Virginia Community College and the nursing program there had a mobile van that they would drive around to some of the neighborhoods. And one of the things they realized was there's a lot of international population in Northern Virginia who did, could not read or understand the form that you fill out when you have to you know, go to the doctor kind of thing. And so to their credit, the students worked with the foreign language majors and got them to translate the form so that it was available in different languages. That's the kind of learning that our students are asking for now. How can I apply this to my everyday life or to my world of work. And that wasn't a question we worried about at that particular point back in the day. Um, we've asked uh, you to identify specific student learning outcomes. What do you expect students to know how to do when they leave you? You know, I mean, is that so unrealistic? And you know, faculty often will say, well, I have a syllabus. Yeah, but your syllabus doesn't always say what you're going to learn. It tells you what chapter we're gonna cover, when and when the tests are, but it doesn't say, but this is what you're supposed to be learning while you're doing this. Um, the students today, are, I'm sorry, the faculty today are much more technologically savvy. I remember going from 16 millimeter projectors. You all remember those? I, we had to splice those <laughs> film back together because we had used them so much at that particular time to suddenly we have computers, you know? Wow, we've, now you've got a computer on your wrist or your finger nowadays. We've come such a long way, but it is now causing you to teach differently. You put your, uh, I mean, in spite, before COVID and online instruction forcing us uh, to become innovative, we were finding ways to make learning possible for students who worked and couldn't get there, who had children uh, and they couldn't get away from home because their kids were sick um, or for whatever reason. And so we've had to become more technologically literate. I went to NOVA in 1998, and that was when over there they were just giving computers to faculty. And I had faculty say, you can put a computer on my desk, but I'm not gonna use it. 
fine, you don't have to, but I'm not sending you another memo by paper, so if you want to know what's going on, you better make friends with somebody who is turning on their computer. <laughs> Within the first 30 days, I had more requests for software that we had not provided, that faculty wanted to use in their classes. And so I was able to say, okay, fine, we have uh, five campuses. As long as you can share this software with folks from other campuses, then I'll give you this pot of money to go out and do some research on this particular software. So it, it took that kind of uh, partnering with each other in order to get faculty comfortable with, uh, with those. Support staff always had to deal with computers because they were the ones registering students or giving them federal financial aid and we had automated that and, and computerized that uh, long before we did instruction. But you know, now with social media and uh, which I'm so glad I grew up before social media, I don't know what to do. My life is not, the, the things in my life that I wouldn't want shared are not out on social media. I'm very much on social media now. You can find everything, including where I live. But um, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and Twitter or X, whatever they're calling themselves now, are all ways that students communicate and find out. Our, as institutions, we've gone to emergency alert, syst alert systems that are technologically based so that when something catastrophic is happening in our institutions, then we're able to notify students very quickly. So technology has kind of taken over us whether we've wanted it to or not. Um, our expectations, though, seem to be different and questionable. We don't necessarily have the same level of expectations that our faculty had of us or that we had when we first started out. We, we make excuses for students sometimes. Oh, well, they're working. Oh, where they have to. Yeah, well, but they're going to be out to work, and no employer is going to make those exceptions for them. So why are you making those exceptions for them? If they've committed to coming to take a class, then they've committed to doing the work necessary to survive and pass that class. Uh, there are, life does get in the way of students. It always has and it always will, and you just have to find a way to get around it. But please, whatever you do, don't lose those high expectations of students. Don't scare them to death on the first day of class and tell them, you know, all this stuff that you have for them to do or what those expectations are, but let them understand that this is what you're going to need to do to be successful in this class. Here's where I am available to help you reach that level of success, or here are student tutors over here who will help you do it, or here's some study groups over here. Provide those support services for them, but don't let that level of expectation drop just because you know, they live on this side of town or they have this level of income or they're on Pell Grants or whatever. Monetary considerations should not have anything to do with expectations of student skills. I had commentary for the day. Students are still, uh, still large numbers of academically underprepared students. Uh, as they were in the past. Um, more and more of them are first-generation college-going students, which means that they don't have people at home who have lived the process and understand how to get through it and how to navigate it. I used to tell students, if you can get through registration, classes will be a piece of cake. <laughs> because we make, we make registration so difficult. I mean, we, we really do. Even we've gone from you know, in-person registration to online registration to telephone, no, to telephone registration to online registration, but you still have 85 steps through which you have to pass in order to be, get registered. If you don't believe it, go through PG's uh, registration process. If you have not done that, you should do that just to see what your students have to go through. I mean, you've got them spread, and I don't know that you all do, but colleges tend to have them spread out across the campus. You have to go to this building and then to that building and find that building. Signage is not always the best. Uh, there are not always people who are willing to help. Um, more and more, I, I think community colleges are friendlier places than our senior institutions because usually during registration you're going to have buttons to say, ask me or um, you know, you've got people strategically placed around to look for those 
what, where am I supposed to go, expressions that students have, but it is, it is difficult to get through registration when you're talking about people who, <laughs> if they're recent high school graduates, were still asking for bathroom passes in the spring, <laughs> and yet you expect them to be able to successfully navigate your registration system. That ain't gonna happen. Uh, I remember back in the, the day when women were not the majority of the students in school, they would sit in their cars panic struck to get out to go register. They just, they didn't, uh, they weren't comfortable doing that. They, they hadn't done that. And when you have first generation college going students who don't have people at home who've been through the process, it makes it very difficult and, uh, for them to feel comfortable coming into the door, let alone getting through the process. Uh, today, students are still mostly female, which was different than when I was in school. My mother, for example, uh, was supposed to go to college to find a husband, and my grandmother was very upset when she didn't. Uh, <laughs> she went to Fisk University, where my Harry Medical School was right across the street, and when she didn't come home for a doctor, my grandmother was livid. <laughs> my mother said, I saw a maid. I didn't want one of them. Uh, but today, they're mostly female. Uh, about 8 million of them are adults. Uh, a large percentage are ethnic minorities. Uh, most of them are working, if not part-time, full-time. Uh, and nowadays, they're mostly part-timers. That's very different than when most of us were in school. We were all full-time. We went there. We knew what it was. We were getting out in four years because we couldn't afford to stay any longer. Um, you know, we pushed ourselves to take 16 and 18 hours so that we didn't have to go to summer school. Nowadays, it takes students longer to get out of school because many times they're taking one or two classes at a time. We had to argue with the federal government about using uh, first-time, full-time students to measure the effectiveness of an institution. When you only have 10% of your students who are first-time, full-time, uh, it's tough to say that you're not being successful because you're only graduating X percentage of your students when such a small percentage of the, of the ones being used to calculate that number. <laughs> they, don't, they didn't count transfer students. You can't tell me that PG County doesn't impact a student's life even if they don't graduate from here but they transfer to someplace else. So we did get the feds to change their mind on that one. Uh, and they do now include part-time students in their numbers and transfer students. I'm very pleased to, that we went to bat for that because that just made absolutely no sense whatsoever to me. Uh, but then a lot of what the feds do doesn't make sense to me. Um, <laughs> Again, being first generation means they have little support at home. Uh, they've not, a uh, few of them have known failure in college they, and in high school either. I mean, it's amazing to see so many students coming out of high school, you know, at the top of their class and they get to college and just fall flat on their face because there is a different way to study. There's a different level of expectation. There's much more self-direction that is expected of those students that they've never had before, and they don't have anybody to tell them how to get through the situation. Uh, they have limited college survival skills. One, two of the areas that have never been an issue, and for me, when I was either a faculty member or an administrator, was food and housing insecurity. And yet now, so many of our students are experiencing that. That has to impact the performance in a classroom. If I'm hungry, all I'm hearing is my stomach growling. I am not paying attention to what, you know, Dr. Williams or Jones or Smith or Krzywonski or whoever is saying out there. I mean, that makes it, if I don't know where I'm gonna sleep tonight, that makes a difference. And so many more of our students are experiencing that, that our support services are having to do things they've never had to do before because of the circumstances in which our students find themselves. But they can email, and they can text, and they can pull, find out what's going on on TikTok. Boy, I tell you, no matter how old they are, they know about that social media stuff going on out there. So we have to learn ways to help them use the skills they do have in order to be successful in our classes. Uh, the classes, uh, we have more and more online classes, not just because of COVID, but because students 
uh, are working and they, you know, we still <laughs> build a, a class schedule for the, um, for faculty. We do. Uh, we put in classes because that's when faculty say they want to teach them as opposed to when students need the class available. Uh, I'm sure you don't do that here. I have no doubt that you, you don't do that here. But most of our institutions are still going to run classes 9, 10, 11, and 12, and you can fire off a cannon after 1 o'clock in any building and not hit a soul. Even though we have students who may work in the morning and need classes in the afternoon. So now we've gone to online classes, distance classes, so that those students can indeed get the instruction that they need in order to finish their curriculum. We have more learner-centered classrooms than faculty-centered classrooms, where we're now engaging students and letting them teach themselves sometimes, or making them responsible for reading stuff before they get to class, rather than me spending time explaining stuff to them in the class, and yet talking about now how does that fit into what it is that you want to do. There are specific objectives that we've identified uh, that tie into learning activities. Service learning, I think, was one of the best things for the current population of students because it does give them a practical application of the theoretical concepts we've tried to teach them. And it makes sense to them. If Reggie had had a way, Reggie's my son, to apply that Algebra II uh, stuff, then it would have made a lot more sense to him than just having to sit there and learn formulas. Uh, there are increased support services that are needed. We have many more now than we ever had. Again, the housing and food insecurities are two areas. But tutors and advisors and uh, food pantries and clothing uh, pantries and stuff are now out there to help students get through some of the uh, issues that impact their learning. One of the new areas, new for higher education, not necessarily new for community colleges, are short-term credentials. Um, one of the challenges accreditors have, and Middle States has it just like we do, is that many of the credentials are offered through continuing education or non-credit. And we don't evaluate their effectiveness. We don't evaluate the quality of non-credit stuff. And so now we've got to find a way to ensure that what's being taught there and being brought to the traditional credit side of the house does indeed have value and is indeed uh, providing uh, the instruction that students need to have. We've got a committee that's trying to figure out um, how to do that and what it is it that we need to be able to do. Uh, we, we try, we don't always get credit, but we try. <laughs> Administrators generally went through uh, educational administration programs rather than pure academic programs. You find many more administrators today with um, like my doctorate is in educational administration with a concentration in community college leadership as opposed to psychology or biology or history or anything because their role is to run this organization. It's not necessarily, and it's the management of a higher education enterprise rather than a particular curricular offering. We still work with local communities to identify job training needs, to identify uh, the, the right curriculum for uh, the, what, what we're training students to do to be able to go out into the workforce. We are working with senior institutions to ensure transfer opportunities. I had told my board that they would know I was ready to retire when I came forth with a, a proposal uh, for a new policy that said all SAC COC accredited institutions will accept all credits from all other SAC COC accredited institutions, no questions asked. I'm ready to retire, but I'm not bringing that policy forward because it will be World War III, and I've already, I'm sorry, it'll be World War IV, and I already have World War III going on in my region. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, but th there are, there's hope because there are pockets of transfer agreements in place. I worked in Virginia for 18 years. My last position there was Secretary of Education to Mark Warner when he was governor. And one of the reasons I, I chose to leave NOVA and do that was, one, because they had never had a community college person at the governor's table before, and I just felt that was an opportunity I couldn't miss. And two, because one of his platform items was to build coalitions between the senior institutions and the community colleges so that students could have an easier transfer 
uh, route in the Commonwealth. Well, that's fine, but what if I live in, in North Carolina and I want to go to Virginia? Then I don't have that transfer agreement. What if I live in Maryland even and want to go to Virginia? We don't have those kinds of agreements. So the good news is within states, we're finding many more articulation agreements in place so that students can know ahead of time if you're going to transfer to University of Maryland or, or Bowie State, these are the courses that you need to take because this is what's going to transfer. But we don't have it across a region or across the country. And that's still debilitating for students, especially our military families who have to move a lot and end up taking, I was going to say crap, but stuff over and over again because you won't accept the credits from that other institution. That just makes no sense, at least for a general ed curricula. You know, English 101 should be English 101, should be English 101 no matter where you take it. I'm sorry. Um, but it's not. Uh, if you didn't take it at my place, then it can't be good. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> The uh, fa administrators aren't staying in their jobs long either compared to um, historically. It used to be that when a president uh, came in, that vice president of academic affairs generally was his or her successor. Now, pre I mean, then presidents were staying so long that VPs and presidents were retiring at the same time. Nowadays, we've got presidents that are not staying in place more than one or two years. That's not going to happen here. I know your president, she good. She's going to be fine. Uh, but there, I mean, in our region, I, uh, last year, we had 93 new presidents out of 780 institutions. That's a big turnover. And most of them had not been in their jobs five years. So we, we, I'm worried about that. I really am because of that instability uh, in that position. It puts instability on the institution. Uh, and so part of that is because there's, I think, there's not support for the president to help him or her learn how to navigate that job. Um, there's also um, salaries is another one. Uh, you know, I mean, there are lots of reasons for it happening. Board members don't know how to choose presidents is another one. Um, I interviewed for a job once, and at the end of the interview, they asked me if I had anything I wanted to say. Of course, I always have something to say. But I said, uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity, but if I were in your position, I would not offer me this job because I'm not the right fit for it. And they said, but you've done this and this and this. I said, yes, I know, but I haven't done this and this and this and this. And your faculty would want to know, where in the world did you find this woman? You know, but you'd have the support of the board. And I said, but you're not on campus every day either. So you have to know what fits in an institution. Uh, it's difficult for some boards to um, choose a president that has a very different set of experiences than other presidents they've had or anybody that they've known personally. And I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, trustees are more often skilled in areas of business, or at least of finance, of curriculum development. They know the different parts of an institution. They weren't just put there so much for uh, how much they contributed, but now they're actually being put in place and even being elected based on the skill sets that they're bringing forward, which is what's helping our institutions grow and survive. Uh, we have now put in a requirement that all boards have to evaluate themselves and how well they get along and how well they do their job. This was interesting because we had some boards that, uh, whose institutions were in financial trouble and they had no clue because they didn't know how to read a, a financial spreadsheet. And why are you here? Uh, you know, or, <laughs> or enrollment was, was declining and they didn't understand you know, the enrollment plan that they had. I mean, a lot of different reasons. So now we've said, okay, we need to make sure that you know what it is that you're doing as a board member because you know, you're setting the tone for this particular institution. And if you don't know what you're doing, then it doesn't matter where this institution's headed because it's not going to get there. Uh, there is a, a political shift that is occurring, at least in my region. That's why I said thank you for letting me out of the South for a day. Um, I have uh, 11 red states, and there's nothing wrong with being a red state, except that there is a political platform where the governors in those states are now trying to assess institutions in ways they've never done that before. That accreditors have been the ones to look at the quality of an institution. 
And so there are big questions about academic uh, freedom. There are questions about shared governance. Uh, there are questions about uh, programs that are provided to ensure that the students who enroll have the services that they need. There's a, um, a, an onslaught of laws in lots of states, not just in the South, but in, specifically in the South, on diversity, equity, and inclusion programs that have been designed to support services for those students we talked about for whom this is their first time there or they need whatever the support uh, that they need for housing and food insecurity and military families moving around and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's going to be different. There's a perception that we have been the uh, bastions of liberalism forever and that we don't employ any conservative faculty or staff and that we don't have any conservative uh, speakers on our campus and it's just not true. Uh, but we've not done a good job of helping folks understand. You, if you read the um, Inside Higher Ed or the Chronicle of Diverse Issues every day, then you'll know that there's a group of presidents who have now set up this um, uh, program, for lack of a better word, where they're all going to address democracy and how we get to it at our particular institutions in an attempt to not take back our institutions, but to help people learn to, that what we really do is to expose students to all kinds of thinking and all kinds of ways of doing things, not just the liberal way, as it were. So this is, this is interesting. Uh, it's played out in the newspapers in, in my st uh, states very loudly, largely because at least one of those governors is running for president of the United States and wants to carry that uh, message across the country, not just in his state. So uh, it, it's interesting. Of course, interesting is a word I use when I have nothing nice to say, but it is interesting. <laughs> Today, um, accreditors are still ensuring the quality of offerings. We think that it's more important today than ever before, even though we've all been around since the late 1890s. But because what we do as an institution of higher ed directly impacts the job market and our standing as a, a world power, if we don't keep people employed, at levels that we need them, then we're going to lose positional power as a powerhouse in this, in this world. We are now focused on student success, not so much student access, because we've got colleges for everybody now. Now the goal is we got them in, let's get them out with some skills and some certification so that they can go out and uh, pay taxes so I can retire. Uh, <laughs> and contribute, uh, you know, as we'd like to think we have contributed. We're looking at completion rates, um, not just graduation rates, but how many of you students move from a de uh, developmental curriculum to a, a college level curriculum? How many uh, come back from one semester to the next? How many are transferring? How many are getting a degree? Um, what is the license passage rate for your nursing programs, for your welding programs for all of your occupational technical programs. Uh, and then how many of them are actually getting jobs that are paying more than they were making before they came to you in the first place? Um, you know, in other words, what value do we have as institutions? The federal government asked this question when they realized how much student financial aid they were providing and then looking at graduation rates of institutions. That's when we started the conversation of you can't just look at first-time, full-time students. That is not fair to an institution. You have to look at all the students they serve. But it doesn't let you off the hook when you still only have a 20% graduation rate when you t or transfer rate when you take all of that in. We lose a lot of students, sometimes because life gets in the way, sometimes because we shaft them. I mean, we, we just do. We don't pay attention to their needs. You know, we leave it up to them to find us if they have questions. Some of them don't know what the hell to ask. They've never been to college before. I don't know what I don't know. I just know I don't know it. And I don't know how to ask you to explain it because I can't tell you what it is I don't know. And so they would rather not come and be berated or belittled, you know, when you look at them, well, why don't you know? I said this six times in class. Yeah, well, I'm one of them 10 time people. You got to tell me 10 times before I know what's going on. They just don't understand how to deal with that. And so it does make a difference 
um, sometimes in the things that we do, not offering classes when we need to offer them because students need them to graduate or to transfer. Uh, you know, those are the kinds of things that institutions, for which institutions have to accept responsibility for doing to students, as opposed to just students not having the skill sets to, uh, to be successful. Um, our accreditors are much less prescriptive than they ever have been before. We used to literally count library books per discipline. And we did that because faculty said that if I have a student writing a paper, they need to have as many original sources as possible. So we literally counted library books. Then in the 90s, everything went online. What do I count? Uh, and so we don't do that anymore. We leave it up to you to tell us what it is that, uh, that you think is appropriate for what it is that you're doing. Um, there are a lot of special initiatives that are out there to address our student needs, which uh, some have been around a long time, some are, are popping up nowadays. There are a lot of reclamation programs for African American males and other special group recruitment projects and retention projects to keep them in school. When you look at the numbers of students and the uh, ethnic groups and socioeconomic groups to which they belong, uh, they don't look like they did when I was in college. There is a very different population with very different needs uh, and very different expectations. And so sometimes it is necessary to offer a helping hand in order to get them in and to keep them in to graduation. We have started a sharing data among institutions, which is wonderful. Uh, although we have, we have our, our basic tenant in, in this uh, southern region is that of integrity. You know, if this thing called accreditation is a continuous improvement process, don't lie to us or don't hide things from us. First of all, because there's always going to be somebody on campus waiting for the committee to come to say, ah, I know what they told you in that report, but let me tell you the truth. <laughs> but more than anything, we can't help you improve if we don't know what the issues are. But we had a couple of institutions that got hit with an integrity violation because they did just that. They contacted a sister institution and said, what did you, what did you tell the commission you know, to, to get through this? How did you document compliance? And the institution was nice enough to share their report, but the institution receiving the report forgot to take the name of the other institution <laughs> off of the report. Yeah, just because you have degrees doesn't mean that you have common sense, I guess. But, uh, so when you're going to share data, it is for you to observe and compare, not necessarily use, uh, when you are talking about your own institution. So I caution you uh, of that when you get ready for middle states. Make sure you're giving them your data. But you know, it's fine to ask other institutions, how do you document completion? How do you define success? You know, what, what kinds of programs do you have there? Uh, imitation is still the sincerest form of flattery. And if you have a successful institution, then borrow what it is that they have, but make it your own, whatever you do. There is a, an increased attention on accountability. That's not going away. Uh, the feds are still very uh, determined that we give them successful students given how much money they are investing in higher education. And I can't say that I blame them for that. Uh, there is also an increased attention on retention. It's a lot cheaper to keep a student than it is to recruit a new one. It really is. And those students tend to be your best recruiters. If they're happy here, then they're going to tell their friends, hey, man, this is the best thing you know, uh, for me. Come on over, and we can go to class together. I can tell you which faculty to avoid and which ones to take. And you know, they, they still do that. I should put that up there from the old days. We, we still had a list of the faculty but, you know, by toughest to easiest and you know, everything in between. But we, we want them to be successful and matriculate through to graduation. Um, I, it was interesting when, um, in one of my presidencies, faculty didn't want to go to commencement. And I'm going, first of all, I want to make sure that that sucker that gave me trouble is leaving. <laughs> so I'm going to show up to commencement to make sure that he walks across that stage. But secondly, don't you want to see the fruits of your labor? You know. You know the challenges through which your students had to, had to go in order to get there. Uh, and the best thing in the world to me is a community college commencement where you can hear, yay, grandma, 
or yay ma when that person walks across the stage. I just don't understand how anybody cannot want to go to commencement. It's a pain to sit there, especially when you're a large institution and have 2,000 students walking across. Try to shake the hand of all 2,000 of those students though, so. Um, but yeah, it's, that, that is that. So what does that mean for tomorrow? Where do we go from here? Well, faculty will be fewer in number because students are going to be teaching themselves and we're going to be online and we somehow think that you can accommodate more students online than you can in an in-person class. Uh, there'll be more real life experiences that will be brought to the classroom. We have a lot of people who didn't start their careers as educators but they went out in the real world and did work and now they're coming to higher ed to bring their skill sets and apply them uh, you know, to the theory in a classroom. Uh, we're gonna have mostly female. If most of our students are female, then that means most of the graduates are gonna be female, which means most of the job applicants are gonna be female, which again is very different. I didn't have a female faculty member in undergraduate school. Not one, not even in PE. So that's a very different perspective, which brings a, a different mindset for a lot of problem solving and ways of doing things. Uh, and you're gonna have an increased number of minorities. If again, the largest percentage of students in your schools are minorities who will be graduating, they're gonna be the ones to get jobs. It's a big culture shift that's gonna occur. And you all are part of um, grooming that culture shift because the students who are with you today are hopefully the ones who are going to replace you or excuse me succeed you <laughs> when you retire <laughs> you're irreplaceable I know that uh, students uh, again will be largely minority still largely Hispanic because they tend to be having more babies than the rest of us uh, they're mostly female, they are older, 18 to 45. They are still, unfortunately, academically underprepared. Some of that also has to do with the K-12 curriculum. Um, and, you know, I, I have always suggested that community college faculty need to go offer to substitute in a K-12 classroom for a day if for no other reason than it gives you a greater appreciation for what those teachers have to go through. But more than that, it allows the students to see what they will experience when they go to college. Because if you go lecture in a K-12 class like you would lecture in a college class, it would actually give them a flavor for what to expect. Now, you don't want to run them off, but you do want them to be exposed to that. Uh, most of the students tomorrow will be part-time, and they want a job. That is a different focus from why I went to college. I wanted to save the world. I wanted to make it a better place. My mother, of course, her goal was for me to get a job, but uh, my, mine was not that. This is the focus. Uh, just tell me how little I have to take in order to go be able to get a job. That's one of the reasons credentials are becoming such a big deal, because students have that little chunk of credibility that they can apply to a job. Now, they'll have to come back and get that next level, perhaps, but right now they're very short-sighted and just they want to get into the workforce. That's, again, they need to take care of their families and they need those jobs. Uh, the classes are, again, going to be largely online. There'll be a greater inclusion of real world and life experiences to uh, augment instruction. There's a greater expectation that will students will have uh, learned before they come to class. We're gonna put more of that onus on them. Um, you know, with Google out there, um, you know, I still remember the college catalog that was our Google uh, in the library. And <laughs> when I, I was in Lynchburg at Central Virginia Community College when the uh, everything became automated, and we literally had a moment of silence as they rolled the last card catalog out of the library. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it was, you know, memories. You would go to the library and you would have to go through and, and figure out the number, and then you'd go to the stack and find the book, and you had to go through, and you didn't want to have to do that more than once. <laughs> Students today will look something up on Google, they'll write it down, and if they need it again, they'll go Google it again. 
Uh, you know, it's a different way of learning at this particular point, but we, we are going to have an expectation that you've got that knowledge at your fingertips. My job here in this institution is to help you apply it, because that's what they want to be able to do. Uh, and again, the credentials as smaller pieces of program administrators are going to have a greater need to stay current with emerging technologies because they're changing so rapidly. There's going to be a greater need to adapt to change because change is happening not just in technology. I mean, look at artificial intelligence. I don't even know what that means for us yet. You know, other than, I mean, you hear it about, uh, I started to say Snapchat, that's not what that is, chat GPT, but what other impact is artificial intelligence going to have? And it doesn't mean we won't have any faculty late uh, in the future because they'll all be using artificial intelligence. Um, there's a continued focus on developing a, skill set, a skilled workforce, uh, both among the students and the staff. The professional development that is necessary to keep the current faculty and staff apprised of the changes that are going on are not going to get any less, and administrators have to continue to find money. When the budget's cut, usually the first thing they cut is travel and professional development. You can't do that if you expect your faculty and staff to be able to meet the needs of today's and tomorrow's students. And then finding money for the institution is still a biggie. It becomes more and more important because, especially in public institutions, because state funding has declined so uh, precipitously. When I first went to Virginia, uh, the General Assembly paid 70% of the cost of educating each student. Now it's down to 9%. And so you got to find the money. If it's not a tuition increase, where is it? So you got to find grants and you got to find donors and you know and provide naming uh, opportunities for people to be able to give you some money. That's a, a new role, even in community colleges. Trustees are having to be those people to better advocate for those finances. They're still the ones that the community knows, that the legislators know, and so you want to be able to get credible people uh, to be able to go and help you do the things you need to do. Support the creation of a culture of evidence to be able to have data to show funding sources and legislators that here are our successes. Here's where we need to improve, which is why we're coming to you for this uh, particular assistance. And then to continue to develop policies for student success. I remember um, one of the, at uh, Northern Virginia, about 50% of George Mason's junior class was made up of transfers from Nova. I used to tell their presidents, you know, you'd be nice to me, I'm gonna cut off your transfer supply. Uh, because they did. But they weren't graduating from Nova, they were just transferring to Mason. And when we looked at the data to figure out why, it was because they didn't take orientation. And so I was brazen enough to put in a policy that says, before you enroll in semester hour 13, you got to take orientation. And faculty would say, well, but what about all the part-time students? If a part-time student has committed to 12 hours, they need to know the rules and regulations and policies and procedures as well. Graduation rate increased 30% that first year because we forced them to take orientation. It's policies like that that help students become successful. That meant that students left with a degree, not just with 59 credit hours. Because going into the world of work, they want to see that you've completed something, even an associate degree not just to transfer to a senior institution. And so those policies make a difference. Tomorrow, accreditation is not going away, people. Uh, I'm sorry, there's still going to be a demand for accountability, whether it's from the federal government or the states or your local uh, citizens and, and taxpayers. There's still going to be that need to show that you have value. There is a continued focus on student success measures. We want to make sure at, that we can show how students are being successful and what are the things that we're putting in place to ensure that success. And then continued measures of quality in all areas. And the bottom line is that student success is still the reasons institutions of higher education exist. We should be here for the students to make their lives better 
The fact that we are employed and able to make a good life for ourselves should not be the primary reason that we're here. We should be here to enable students to be able to do the same. Hello, thank you for sharing all this very important information with us. I'm Margot Jenkins with the English department. In one of your slides, you mentioned that Few students today have experienced failure. I'd like for you to give us your thoughts on that. Do you attribute that to part of uh, the No Child Left Behind Act and how K-12 had adopted that? I think part of it is because of great inflation. You asked me. <laughs> part of it is low expectation. The curriculum not being as challenging in K-12 as it has been historically. Uh, you know, a lot of it, because we give um, awards for participation, <laughs> you know, uh, and so nobody's failed in anything. If I participated, I get a trophy. Uh, used to be if you placed first, second, or third, you got a trophy, but otherwise, thank you very much for participating, but we're not recognizing that. And so all of that, I think, together uh, has played a part in the fact that uh, they've not really known failure. They haven't had to work hard to succeed at being first, second, third, or fourth. Mm -hmm. uh, whether No Child Left Behind did that or not, I don't think so. I think that the purpose of No Child Left Behind was to make sure that students who look like me weren't ignored anymore. Uh, and whether it, it did that or not, I don't know. But I think it was a, an attempt to, to ensure that all students' needs were attended to and my eighth grade teacher would die if I just ended that sentence in a preposition talking to an English faculty member, I apologize. <laughs> Thank you for all you do. It is more important today than, than it ever was 50 years ago when I started, I promise you that it is. Don't get deterred, understand that you do have a major role to play and don't give up on your students. They need you more than they know they do. Thank you for inviting me, I appreciate it.